So uh, I wanted to get the, the participants' opinion on what health science education research is. Maybe we can take one minute. If you guys want to write stuff in the chat um, about what you think this actually means. So um, thanks, guys, for contributing. Um, so part of the issue was when I started talk, thinking about this topic, it's really hard to define what health science education research is. So if you look at the chat, you can see what people have proposed. And then basically, I tried to look at what domains of research fall into uh, health uh, sciences education research. And then you can see that basically there are the things that you've mentioned, right? Topics of professionalism, professional identity, information, um, development, innovation, learning, curriculum development, assessment and program evaluation, decision making, training, education, healthcare system interactions, and there's probably others as well that we have captured. Um, but the, the interesting thing is, it's actually if you look for a definition, it's a little bit vague. Uh, you know, all the parts and uh, components of this, um, um, but that's why it's a bit of a challenge, I think, when people are trying to answer on the chat as well. Um, so when we look at roles within health sciences education, um, there was a paper in 2017 by Dr. and colleagues that really tried to define what roles individuals can have. And they basically uh, conducted interviews with uh, health professional education um, uh, scholarship leaders in Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and the United States, uh, as well as Netherlands. And really, they tried to come up with uh, definitions for um, uh, what an individual can be doing uh, within health science education. And really, they came up with three that overlap. There's something that's called a clinician educator. And their definition is basically it's a uh, an individual who's trained as a clinician in health profession and engages in clinical activities and should have active engagement in health professions education activities and to be consistently engaged in and disseminate health professions related education scholarship. So really the component of engaging in research and disseminating scholarship is uh, Health professions education research scientists. Um, you can see in the, in the diagram, um, is another um, role. So this is an individual who holds a graduate level degree, right? either a PhD level and occasionally a master's level in an academic discipline, which could be education, psychology, anatomy, and engineering, and should be formally uh, engaged in health professions related education scholarship. And lastly, um, the administrative leader is an individual that primarily focuses on educational leadership activities, such as being an academic lead or a substantial component of a health professions education training program. So this is our deans, assistant deans, department chairs. Um, so based on this, I think all of us who are on the call can probably figure out which category they fall into. And some of us probably are going to be across the categories. So I was trying to think where I fit in I, I'm more in the uh, research scientist role, but also as a clinician educator. But the key component for this is really there has to be education scholarship involved across all of the uh, all of the roles. Um, so in terms of how did I end up here? So you know there was an interesting paper written about some of the how some individuals end up in uh, health. Uh, professions education research is a is a sort of a serendipity thing, but uh, as I tried to look at my trajectory, um, not, some of it was uh, fortunate and some of it was a lot of hard work. So um, I did my medical school at the University of Toronto, and then I did uh, half of my general surgery training. At which point, I stepped out to do a uh, a clinician investigator program, where I started in uh, in a master's uh, stream and then uh, transferred into a PhD. Uh, really focusing on uh, surgical education, curriculum development, and assessment. And then I came back and finished off my general surgery training. And uh, I was able to produce this lengthy document that all of us who have done master's and PhD work know that it takes a lot of grunt work to write a thesis. But um, I was fortunate to be supported by the Royal College, the PSI Foundation, and the CIHR Master's Award um, for my thesis work that I did in 2014. And then I went on to do some additional clinical training and then was very fortunate to get uh, recruited to Queen's in 2016 for, uh, as both a, uh, a medical education scholar supported by CIMO as well as a bariatric and foregut surgeon uh, and a general surgeon. And then uh, I think some of you will enjoy this graph. Basically this is, especially as people finish off their 
uh, either master's or PhD degrees or uh, their clinical training, what they think their intended career path is and what actually happens in real life. Um, and then why some people consume alcoholic beverages or other uh, drugs that are illegal these days. So then I wanted to look at graduate studies in health sciences education and what are the current options that we have. And I think there is really a slew of uh, options of how you can get some additional training in health science education. And then there are things that are called fellowship or diploma programs. And then we have that as well at our institution. Um, and these are defined generally as a shorter course um, programs where you spend approximately uh, one or sometimes two years, um, usually without a thesis component, and generally tends to be a pass fail. Um, and most of these uh, fellowship and diploma programs are geared towards individuals who are either current faculty or prospective faculty uh, from various health professions. We have our traditional master's and doctorate degrees. Um, these could be part-time or full-time. Uh, these could be course-based or thesis-based. And there is either um, distance education, on-campus programs, or blended learning models. Um, there was a study in 2012. So the data for this is probably about two years before that, so somewhere around 2010, 2011, um, where a, uh, a group of authors looked at uh, a survey across uh, the globe looking at uh, master's degrees in health professions education worldwide. And I was trying to find, um, I think Dr. Flynn did some of this similar work as well, but I couldn't find uh, a specific publication. But basically, you can see here that there is a, a relatively um, uh, uh, wide distribution in terms of continents where these programs are offered. Uh, and back then, it was uh, nine programs in Canada. However, the number is a lot higher now. And you can see on the graph on the right-hand side that there is generally uh, a good mix in terms of how the, the education is delivered, um, the in-person blended model versus completely online. And then here you can see uh, what most of the programs are going to be covering in terms of their curricular objectives. Um, so there's topics of curriculum development, education and assessment, um, um, research methods, uh, components of leadership and management as it applies to health professions education, as well as uh, theories regarding teaching and learning, motivation, feedback, um, as well as small and large group teaching. Um, you can see that most of these programs are about two years in duration. And there's a, is, there's a useful website uh, and that I've uh, put on my slide there, which is www.famer.org, which actually lists all of the, most of the available programs uh, across the world, which can give you an idea of um, what each of the programs offers and what are the options. I'd like to put in a plug for a program that's starting later on this year at Queen's, which is uh, Masters of Health uh, Professions Education which is a blended model with both distance education and, and on-campus activities. Um, and I know Dr. Flynn and uh, uh, Dr. Stotley did a lot of work as well as uh, a lot of the other people who are on the, on the uh, call today. If you look at the doctorate level programs, um, this is data from 2014. You can see there's a lot fewer. So there's, there were 24 back then. And again, most of them are United States, Canada, and in Europe. Uh, and again, there is a good mix about, of um, faculty only, uh, sorry, face-to-face -face, uh, versus distance education versus blended models. Um, <clears throat> you can see here that there's really four different streams of how people get doctorate level uh, training in health professions education. There's what's called the North American model, which is a structured program requiring completion of courses, research, publication, as well as a dissertation and a thesis. Um, there's something that's called the European model, which is generally a thesis that's combined of from somewhere between four and six published papers on a topic that had to be peer reviewed. Um, interestingly, when I did my research, I wrote a thesis, but it was combined from, uh, it had embedded basically a number of publications as chapters. There's something that uh, is available as a full-time or part-time uh, program for those individuals employed in health professions education research, where they're supervised by one or two professors to complete a thesis. And there are those programs that are actually not listed on this list, which is uh, where, you have a, where you have a program uh, that is uh, in medical sciences. Um, however, the research is related to health professions education. 
So the actual number is probably a lot higher than what this slide presents. Then I want to spend some time talking about mentorship because I really think, as I was thinking about the trajectory that I had, uh, I don't think I would have, I'm pretty sure I wouldn't be where I am without the appropriate mentorship. And I'll spend a couple of slides talking about what mentorship is about and then highlight some of the mentors that I've had. So the definition of mentorship uh, is a process through which an experienced person, i.e. a mentor, guides another individual, a mentee, in developing skills, knowledge for their professional development. And really, across literature, both in the clinical domains and education domains, mentorship is essential to professional and personal development. And there are a number of potential benefits for mentorship, both for the mentees, for the mentors, and actually organizations as a whole. And you can see that, um, just to highlight a couple from the mentee's perspective, you know, there is increased job satisfaction, there is opportunities for research grant uh, acquisition, enhanced productivity, career advancement. For those individuals that are involved as mentors, um, they are able to develop leadership and coaching skills. Um, they can potentially have renewed, renewed interest in a personal career. Uh, it can also help them in career advancement as well as having a sense of personal gratification and fulfillment by giving back and helping those that are coming um, after them in terms of succeeding in their professions and careers. And from an organizational perspective, there is um, benefits in terms of increased work performance, um, having ability to do strategic planning uh, so that you have individuals who you're going to be able to recruit uh, later on that are coming down the pipeline. Um, there's, pro there's reduced turnover of uh, individuals in the organization um, because the idea is people are more fulfilled um, in their careers. So there are different phases of mentorship, um, which are initiation, cultivation, separation, and redefinition. And uh, I will highlight what each of these one of these phases is and try to define them for you. So in terms of initiation, um, this is generally um, occurs over a short period of time, it takes usually about six to 12 months, where the mentorship relationship commences Commitment is gained by both in the, from both individuals and objectives and expectations are set. Then you move on to the cultivation phase, which usually takes somewhere between two to five years, where you have more frequent and progressively more useful meetings between the mentor and mentee. And during this period of time, both the mentee and the mentor derive optimum benefit from their relationship. Then you move on to what's called the separation phase. So this is when um, the mentorship uh, part is generally winding down. This usually happens over six months to two years. This is when the mentee becomes more confident and more self-reliant, and they're able to then move on uh, to other forms of mentorship that may not require uh, uh, mentee's involvement. And there's something called redefinition phase, uh, which is really an indefinite duration of time where the relationship between the mentor and mentee changes, uh, and where the hierarchy that used to exist previously is no longer present. And these are examples of the personal attributes and behaviors that effective mentors generally are thought to have. So in terms of attributes, they have to be, a mentor has to be generous, has to be enthusiastic and motivating, um, has to excel at active listening, uh, and should assist mentee in reaching their specific career goals, and they have to make themselves available. Um, and generally, the, the relationship and, and, and the way that the individuals uh, work and learn uh, has to agree between the mentor and the mentee and the personal attributes of successful and effective mentees generally involves things such as un being understanding responsive um, being prepared when you come for the meetings so that you're mindful of the mentors uh, time um, being non-judgmental honest and being also able to excel at active listening so when I try to look back at my mentors, uh, you see some individuals from uh, our institution, and this list is by no means um, a, a, an exhaustive list, but you can see our, our dean, um, Dr. Flynn and Dr. Stotley, and then the individuals in the first row are individuals that helped uh, support my uh, PhD research, uh, as well as some of my uh, clinical developments. Next, I'd like to talk about research funding in the field of health professions education. Um, there's, so there's different avenues and streams that an individual can think of. 
Um, initially, when people are starting out, I would encourage individuals to apply for internal funds or, funds or seed funding. So at, que at uh, Queens, uh, we have options uh, through CIMO, uh, through SeaTac, um, uh, as well as some uh, departmental and divisional funds, um, as well as uh, at Queens, the Center for Teaching and Learning also has some uh, internal grants that individuals are able to apply for. These generally are very useful. Um, to get some um, pilot projects done and having pilot project data collected so that you can go on and apply for other funding. Um, then you can explore uh, societal funds. Um, so this could be um, things such as Medical Council of Canada, Royal College, College of Family Physicians of Canada, Physician uh, Services Incorporated Foundation, a bunch of specific um, foundational grants that may be relevant from a clinical perspective if you can tie in the uh, educational component into it. And really, I think for these funding agencies, you need to make sure that the project fits uh, the grant, uh, especially if you're applying for things that are uh, uh, maybe a, more of an interest in terms of patient care. So you need to have an ability to translate how your grant relates to patient care specifically. And then there's tri-council funds, which are the most competitive, usually highest um, amount in terms of funding uh, that we all have uh, challenges with in terms of acquiring. And these clearly require um, a, a good foundation in terms of preliminary work, uh, pilot data, usually multi-institutional and multi- or interprofessional grants that are successful. Then I read, I started reading about what other options there are. There's an interesting paper that uh, uh, Professor Hodges from uh, U of T put out uh, with a couple of co-authors in 2017. And really they were talking about the notion of philanthropy and health professions education research. Um, and how uh, basically their conclusion was that philanthropy uh, and philanthropic donations for um, scholarship are extremely useful. Um, however, most of us have not really been trained uh, as medical education research leaders in terms of how to acquire uh, philanthropic donations. Um, a lot of individuals feel um, unprepared or uncomfortable articulating the impact um, of philanthropy and medical education. And generally, they concluded that this is really an under, underutilized avenue for research funding. So we need to, as we think of um, uh, training individuals in health professions education research, we probably want to try to uh, also spend some time uh, educating them in terms of how to acquire philanthropic donations and also have a good relationship with um, uh, the, um, the office that would normally be responsible for this at both uh, at the university level to help with philanthropic donations for medical education scholarship. And lastly, I want to touch upon what really helps uh, individuals such as myself uh, be successful in terms of my uh, scholarship, which are health professions education scholarship units. And these have been shown to be critical in supporting local engagement in education and scholarship. Uh, they usually have to meet the following criteria. So the unit uh, must stand as a recognizable, coherent organizational entity in the institution. And uh, Dr. Van Valle can uh, really speak to this because uh, he was quite instrumental in creating the unit that I'm going to chat about in a minute. Um, and the unit must be identified as engaging in health professions, education, research, scholarship. The educational scholarship can be, must be, can, may be conducted at the undergraduate, graduate, or postgraduate, uh, or continuing professional development levels. And as you guys are well familiar with, we have the uh, Office of Professional Development and Educational Scholarship uh, that uh, put on uh, these uh, seminars that we're participating on today. And from my perspective, really, it allows like-minded individuals uh, to uh, get together to share ideas and find opportunities for mentorship as well as collaboration. Uh, it provides you with administrative resources uh, that can help you actually get the projects completed and this is really critical for individuals like myself where you have a fair, num a fair amount of clinical work that you also have to balance with the scholarship activities. Um, and you have individuals um, who have expertise in research methods, statistical analysis, um, and other important um, research methodologies. So really, that's what I wanted to share with you, uh, not to take up too much time and to leave uh, some time for questions and also let uh, Josh uh, present his work. Excellent. Um, so thank you so much for, for having me and uh, thank you, Boris, for, for that, that talk. Um, and uh, I think I'll uh, talk about why I 
I started this uh, project and um, this is part of uh, the research I did with uh, my Masters of Health Professions Education, which is wrapping up now. Um, it's done through uh, Maastricht University in Netherlands. It's a distance-based um, uh, master's. And um, so part of this is, is for my thesis on um, uh, that I've completed through there. So today I'll talk to you about um, the Canadian medical uh, matching uh, service that Canadian medical graduates uh, go through and uh, why I was interested in studying this topic. So, um, so Maastricht uh, University is where I can, uh, I attended for two in-person sessions uh, that were um, for several weeks and then uh, most of it has been distance-based and it's been a, a nice experience. The uh, the cohort uh, was about 20 students and uh, this represented about 14 different countries. So there was a really nice uh, multinational uh, collaboration. Um, so it's interesting to sort of learn about that and to be able to communicate at distance as well um, is a skill that I uh, sort of picked up there as well. Uh, if you don't know where Maastricht is, it's down in the south here. I don't know if you can see my pointer, but being a, a, a clinical endocrinologist, uh, one of the sort of analogies that stuck with me was that this is the pituitary gland of Europe. So we're kind of uh, in that little pituitary gland between Belgium and Germany with uh, Netherlands up here. Um, so Aside from my clinical work, I'm a career advisor um, with medical students, and I work through the Student Affairs Committee um, at the Learner Wellness Center, where uh, there's sort of three spheres of uh, uh, activity there, career advising, academic advising, and wellness. And as a career advisor, we provide a longitudinal careers curriculum for medical students where we talk about uh, observerships, uh, summer planning, uh, reflections on decisions for discipline uh, students would like to pursue. Uh, we uh, have them perform personality and career selection tools um, to help with those decisions. We do one-on-one -on -one meetings, uh, CV and personal letter prep, as well as mock interviews, all in anticipation of matching to their postgraduate uh, training program. Um, at the culmination and the end of that process, they enter the Canadian Re uh, Residency Matching Service, CARMS, where um, ideally everyone would be happy with their outcome. Unfortunately, you know, not everybody is completely uh, ha entirely happy, and that's what I wanted to study and focus on why we're, you know, how do we make everyone as happy as possible with that outcome? So, as you can see here, um, you know, this is students who indicated what they wanted to pursue as their training program. And as you can see, there's a fairly high percent that are able to match to their first choice discipline, but somewhere between 10 and 15 percent still um, are not able to, to achieve that. And so students often uh, want to know why that is. And so part, part of that factors into how competitive certain disciplines are. And as you can see here, we have these supply to demand ratios. How many positions are available across Canada and how much demand, how much how, uh, students are requesting these as their first choice discipline and how does that relate to uh, the supply available. So as you can see, as we go down this list, um, the uh, there's more supply uh, to demand and as you get to one and higher, uh, there's more supply than demand. So those positions tend to be less competitive and the ones under one tend to be more competitive. And so that's useful and a definition that we use in our, uh, in this study. Um, so what do students want to know when they, uh, when they see me and the other career advisors? They, they want to know, how do I match to my preferred discipline? I really want to pursue this discipline. Uh, how do I get in? So we talk a lot about the discipline competitiveness, and we talk about the applicant competitiveness, including things on their CV, like volunteer work, extracurricular activities and leadership activities, research productivity, um, how many electives do, should they pursue in that discipline? Uh, where are they generating reference letters? Um, how many applications to submit? Uh, what's the quality of their personal letter? And how do they perform on the interview? So we try to help with all of these aspects. Unfortunately, there's not a lot of uh, literature to help guide us in our um, suggestions. So a lot of what we say is somewhat anecdotal and experience-based. Um, and so that was part of the uh, reason I wanted to pursue this study was to try and 
shed some light on, on these factors. But there's a lot of myths that exist and students tend to do certain things to try and, you know, they have perceived ideas about what will increase their likelihood of matching. And so, uh, for instance, students think that being a, producing a lot of research is going to really up their uh, application and submitting a ton of applications, they think, will sort of increase that. And as a result, we're really seeing this. The, this uh, chart shows from 2013 to 2019, uh, the amount of applications submitted uh, per applicant went from an average of 13.6 uh, applications, so that's 13.6 programs that they applied to, uh, upwards to 21 by 2019. So there's a real perception that submitting more applications is an uh, indicator of matching, and, and we just don't really know whether that's the case or not. Um, and all of this results in stress for students. So preparing for this match is a significant source of stress for students, um, partly because they're now sort of encouraged to make their decision about their career path early, often in pre-clerkship before they've had any clinical exposure. So they're doing observerships early on in the first two years, and it's difficult to make a decision based on just that, but they really have to start planning their electives and their clerkship. Um, and any research early on. Uh, so that's a source of stress. Um, we also know that elective applications and CARMS applications are costly, and so there's financial uh, burden there for students. And finally, students are really fearful about going unmatched, un unmatched, so not matching to a discipline altogether. Um, and this is a fear that they have sort of in the back of their mind, even though they know that the match rates are, are quite good. So what do um, the rates look like for not matching to, a, to any discipline. So as you can see here, um, over time, the rates of students that did not match have gone up, except in the last year. So in turquoise is the number of students who participated in the second iteration of the match. After you've not matched in first iteration, you have the opportunity to match in second iteration. And in turquoise is the number who did not match in second iteration, and in purple is the ones who just didn't want to go in the second iteration. So combined there is the number shown in the, in the red box, and that has steadily increased from about 2015 to 2018, at which point there was a lot of real concern about this, and this was at the time when I was generating this, uh, this idea to do this study, and in about 2018, they started planning to increase the number of residency positions to open up that uh, supply and as a result, the rate of unmatched uh, students did go down. So there's real recognition that um, that was a major problem. So why is it a problem? Why is there a burden of going unmatched? Well, students have a great stigma around them. They're not able to celebrate with their peers if they don't match. Um, there's a disappointment about feeling like a failure. I'm not able to pursue this discipline of interest. They have to pursue or often do pursue an extra year of school electives. And there's a financial strain associated with that. For the medical schools, well, we need to accommodate these students, allow them to do more clinical electives, and, uh, and if you can imagine increasing numbers of students um, over time, that can place a bit of a strain on medical schools to accommodate as well. Uh, and for society, there's a cost associated with training medical students every year, and there's also a need, a need for having trained physicians in the workforce and providing care to our community. So there's societal costs as well to having unmatched students, which you've paid to have trained, and, and they're not entering the workforce. Where does the current lit literature sit? Well, we have some studies examining matching outcomes and student characteristics. However, these are generally based on small studies looking at single programs or single disciplines. They're often survey-based studies, and they're mostly based out of the United States. So there was a need for more Canadian-focused, broad studies looking at uh, what are, how do we link outcomes of matching to student characteristics. So the research questions um, that I generated were, what are the factors that influence a Canadian medical graduate applicant's chance of successfully matching to their first choice discipline? Second question is, um, how do these factors vary by discipline competitiveness? And the third question is, what factors influence a Canadian medical graduate's applicant's chance of going unmatched after the second iteration of the match? So with that in mind, uh, I performed a, 
with uh, local support, um, uh, as well as my supervisor in uh, Netherlands, uh, cross-sectional study uh, based on Canadian data uh, obtained uh, through the Canadian Residency Matching Service database. Um, from 2013 to 2019, a sample of 20,000 students was generated. However, after removing uh, empty data cells, the final analytic sample was 13,500. We used descriptive statistics and uh, binary logistic regression models. Uh, the dependent variables were matching to first choice discipline in first iteration, matching to any discipline in first iteration, and matching to any discipline in second iteration. The independent variables were applicant factors, such as number of applications submitted, uh, self-reported volunteer activities and research activities, publication numbers, uh, as well as demographic factors, as you can see here, including region of medical uh, school attended. To preserve anonymity, we tried to stick with more uh, age brackets as well as uh, regions uh, to, to not specify any in one school or student group. Um, so in terms of descriptive statistics, you can see here that uh, the number of applications submitted on average over the seven years of the study was 19 applications uh, per student per year. Uh, the number of volunteer activities was 7.9, number of research activities uh, 8.2, number of publications 8.6, and number of program ranks received. So how many schools ranked that applicant? 11.2. So of the 19, applications you submitted, you received 11.2 ranks. The, the uh, biggest category of age was 26 to 29 at 60%. Females were 55% of the cohort. And Ontario was the largest uh, location of medical school uh, with 41%. Um, current year graduates means that students proceeded in their four years or three years of typical schooling and then applied. Prior year graduates referred to the fact that they didn't match, and then they were applying again. Um, and then program de competitiveness was based on that supply-demand ratio, as I discussed before, and about 40% applied to a competitive discipline and 60% uh, to a less competitive discipline. So in terms of outcomes, 83.7% uh, matched to their first choice discipline in first iteration. Uh, um, 6% did not match to any choice discipline in uh, first iteration, and so could go on to second iteration. And then in terms of did they match to anything in that year of the match, 96.6% um, did, uh, whereas 3.4% didn't match at all, so they remained unmatched. So what were the factors that were associated with matching to your first choice discipline? Submitting more applications actually reduced the likelihood of matching to one's first choice discipline, albeit a small uh, odds ratio of 0.92. Uh, Reporting more research activities had a small but significant reduction in matching to your first choice discipline. And graduates from Quebec were 52% less likely to match to their first choice discipline. When we stratified by discipline competitiveness, uh, applicants older than 35 uh, or 35 and older were less likely to match to their first choice discipline um, by about 45% uh, compared to younger applicants. And graduates from the West as well as Quebec had a reduced likelihood of matching to their first choice discipline for competitive disciplines. For less competitive disciplines, um, uh, graduates from the West had an increased likelihood of matching to their first choice, whereas Quebec had a decrease. What about unmatched students? What were the factors associated there? Well, compared to prior year applicants, current year medical graduates had a 1.9 times significant more likelihood of matching overall in their year of the match. Applicants aged less than 25 were 25% less likely to match. Males were significantly less likely to match both in first iteration or second iteration compared to females. And applicants from Western schools or Eastern schools uh, were more likely to remain unmatched both after first iteration or second iteration of the match. So what were the major outcomes and key findings here? So as I mentioned, students have been submitting more applications over time. Is that better or worse? And there's 
an associated cost to doing that. There's cost for submission, there's time and effort on the part of the students, but there's also more files to review. So it places more burden on the programs admitting students. These results show that it may not in fact be beneficial and potentially even detrimental to matching success. However, based on this study, it's not really clear to suggest which students might benefit from a more selective approach. Um, that being said, it kind of goes in the face of what was previously believed to be um, uh, a benefit for students. What about the effect of volunteer and research activities? Students are currently trying to spend substantial amounts of time pursuing research um, with the belief that it will improve their matching outcome. This has been shown to actually increase stress um, and it also takes time away from their studies and focus away from their studies. Um, and such a, um, to the point where students uh, may even falsify their applications and misrepresent, um, which has been shown to occur in up to 25% of applications in certain um, disciplines that tend to be more competitive. And so uh, students are really trying to increase their, um, uh, their submission or their, their uh, CV with respect to research activities. Um, Previous studies uh, from the U.S. surveyed program directors, and they found that program directors didn't actually consider research to be of a major uh, importance when ranking candidates, only of low or moderate importance. And that is really corroborated in our study today and Canadian uh, data that there's really no clear benefit for increasing volunteer and research productivity. That being said, the average we found was fairly high at 7.9 volunteer activities and 8.2 research products. And so there's probably some threshold to achieve, but beyond which may not be uh, that beneficial. So what about unmatched students and really characterizing them? And this has not been shown previously. So we found that unmatched students applied to competitive disciplines as their first choice discipline. They tended to be prior year Canadian medical graduates, male, age less than 25, and graduates from Eastern or Western medical students, uh, medical schools. Um, and so there are some limitations in the study. So unfortunately, we're not able to capture a number of subjective measures uh, in this analysis. For instance, what's the quality of an applicant's personal letter, or their reference letters, transcripts, and interview performance? We looked at uh, the variance explained um, by the predictor variables in this model, and it showed that there was a, a variance of 10 to 33 percent, indicating that, as we knew, this wasn't the complete picture for the model. However, nonetheless, the significant findings um, still show some contribution to the factors we analyzed. The other limitation is that when you analyze large sample sizes like this, even small differences can be detected with statistical significance, whereas the actual difference may not be that practically important or meaningful. Um, for instance, in research activities, for instance, there was a significant detrimental effect of research, though the, and it was significant, though the effect was very small. So unlikely to pay, play a major role, either beneficial or detrimental in an in a application. So concluding remarks here, um, there's really no modifiable applicant factors that can increase the likelihood of successful matching. Um, but Contrary to popular belief, increasing research productivity and number of applications doesn't really appear to be beneficial. Significant geographic ge uh, and gender as well as age biases were apparent in this um, analysis. Um, and we were also able to characterize unmatched students, uh, which may help to find a unique solution to this, to this um, concern. Um, so I'd like to thank um, my supervisor in, in Maastricht, Sylvia Hineman, as well as some local collaborators, Kelly House in the Department of Family Medicine, Nancy Dalgarno, and Nicholas uh, Kofi, as well as uh, some collaborators uh, through CARMS who supplied us with uh, the data from CARMS. And our study uh, was funded uh, through a SEMO Endowed Scholarship and Education Fund um, and uh, was accepted for publication just recently in the Canadian Medical Education Journal. So hopefully you can have a look at that if you want to see some more details. So um, thank you for your attention and uh, happy to take any questions. Boris, thank you so much for um, sharing uh, some of your wisdom, but also those phases of mentorship.
I, I was taking notes as you were speaking because we do have a mentorship program that we've set up in health sciences. Um, and, and some of the literature that you mentioned there was, was quite, quite helpful and relevant. Um, Josh, I really appreciated the matching outcomes. I have to say I was surprised that that was a nice segue into what an educational research project could look like. Um, and I was surprised with some of the findings that I didn't anticipate. 